So yeah, today we're going to be talking about bioassay development on Simple Western. And just to highlight the whole online workshop uh, series. So this is going to be uh, now the fourth talk, so the final talk in this initial session here about asset development. And then um, we've got a couple of advanced topics on Simple Western that are coming up next. And then uh, wrapping up with this, um, a group of talks around software, Ella, which is our uh, automated Eliza pro, um, platform, and then the Maurice, which is a Kepler electrophoresis uh, system. Uh, so I have, uh, I do have a background in analytical development. I ran a team in analytical development for a large pharmaceutical company for about four years. Uh, so a number of the resources that I kind of rely on, historically these ones on the left here are ones that I, I relied on. Um, I, I didn't do cell and gene therapy specifically, but uh, I'm familiar with the cell and gene therapy potency guidance that the FDA has submitted or has written. Um, and then also, um, oh, something got deleted here, I'm sorry. Um, there's also a there's also a regulatory guidance that comes out of the, uh, the USDA, which is uh, 800 112, and that is also a, a guidance document that that we're familiar with and 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 consider when we're thinking about some of the conversations that we're having here as well. So today I'm going to talk about I always lead off with this anymore, um, particularly in a talk like this, which is really kind of emphasizing the fact that Simple Western is not a Western. Uh, I think that it's, it's important to make that make that statement early. And um, and then I want to talk about transitioning work onto simple Western assays and then advanced assay development. And then finally uh, talk about some of the stuff that we're seeing with bioassays, particularly around potency assays, and, uh, which is typically done using parallelism type assays. So um, it's more appropriate to call simple Western a replacement for Western blot than it is to call it a Western blot. And uh, this figure in the middle here, these, this is actually my postdoc data. And, and I would defend that this is good data, um, even though I, I twisted the, the signal a little bit to make it look deliberately ugly. Um, so Western blotting is a process. It's the process of transferring your protein from a gel to a membrane, and we literally do not do that step in simple Western because it's one of the biggest sources of variation. Uh, and so that, by definition, means we are not a Western blot. We are we are, we are not a automated Western blot. It's more appropriate to refer to us as a uh, indirect amino assay inside of a capillary. And we're seeing um, sort of more generic nomenclature being sort of built around that. Uh, so I think the name that's sort of bubbling to the top right now is a capillary amino assay or a CIA, although I've also seen people refer to it uh, by other names like capillary um, nano amino assay, so CNIA, I've also seen as well in publications. So as a, as a company, we're, we're very poised to bring these technologies together, capillary electrophoresis and amino assays. So um, we have the ICE product line with its flagship being the Maurice instrument. This is a capillary electrophoresis instrument that are fairly fairly ubiquitous within uh, biopharmaceutical development and, and QC release. Um, the Maurice instrument does uh, charge-based separation, so CIF, and it also does size-based separation using CESTS. And then we're just about to launch this new product called Maurice Flex, which is going to be uh, allow you to also do fraction collection so that you can do downstream analysis of your samples like uh, mass spectrometry. Um, we're also experts in immuno assays. We've got, um, you know, through Biotechnic, we've got the R&D systems and Nova's product lines, uh, which has got a, a large catalog of antibodies. We also sell quantikine kits, which are considered to be gold standards uh, for immunoassays. We have the Ella system, which is a microfluidic automated uh, ELISA system. We sell Luminex as well. So it's really these two technologies that are coming together to uh, do a, a simple Western assay like you see on the chess here. Um, yet, despite that, um, Simple Western has generally been cast as an automated Western blot, and I think we're partly to blame for that. It doesn't help that we branded it Simple Western. Uh, so we typically see it utilized historically as a research tool, a uh, drug discovery tool within pharmaceutical companies. You know, I mentioned that I had a background in analytical development. I actually brought in an instrument for in-process testing. Uh, I think I purchased it back in 2013 when I was running that team in analytical development. 
And uh, we were using it to replace because we were getting inconsistency between an ELISA, a 2DHPLC assay, and we also had some Western blot assays for in-process testing in our um, drug development pipeline. So this Nimble Western instrument was really designed, was brought in specifically to replace all of those assays with a single assay that kind of gives you the same information, but it's much more holistic. So uh, I can I can say, you know, me personally, it has been historically used for in-process testing. But uh, it's really been more recently that we started to see it uh, moving into QC uh, first in IND filing. So we've seen it being moved into phase one, two, and a number of phase, phase three trials where it's a QC release test, including potency testing. Um, and then we've seen it uh, also being used. Um, it's, I, I know of at least one BLA that uh, a simple Western potency assay is, is included in, and um, there are a number of other cases where we're um, actually no, I, I know of at least a, a couple of them, and then we've got um, some some positions where we're in commercial release even at this point, and then and then the other one is is also in vaccine development and vaccine release, and that one um, that one is, is really coming out of more uh, the uh, animal vaccine market than what I've seen in uh, human vaccine development at this point. At least of what I'm familiar with. I, we, we we talk to customers, and when customers are, are okay sharing this information, um, then we're aware of it. But there's a lot of things that customers are doing with their instruments that that we aren't aren't directly aware of. But we know people are doing some really amazing science with the instruments. Um, and so a lot of the lessons, I should say, a lot of the lessons learned here that I'm sharing is through customers who have been comfortable sharing this information with us um, to be able to share it publicly. Uh, but also there's a lot of information that we're also developing in-house. Uh, I'll be sharing a lot of data that's coming through our application science team uh, later on, and I'll mention it when I mention that data. And, and that's data that I think uh, really allows us to have a lot more uh, granularity into the, the precision and, and performance of the instrument and the um, uh, with regard to sort of how it can perform for these types of assays. Okay, so, you know, so I'm getting back to this idea of like where we're starting from. So. Uh, because a lot of uh, people still kind of approach Simple Western really just akin to a Western blot, the, the most common way people are going to run assays is the way you would run a normal Western assay, which is how do you normally run a Western? You, you take your sample, you, you perturb your protein of interest in some way, and then you load the sample at the same concentration, the same amount of total protein in every single well, and then you're just looking for changes in that protein signal. Here's a great example of it here. This is a DTAC, so this is a ProTac used to, to uh, Target degradate uh, for targeted degradation of your protein of interest. This is uh, Protac is a is a product that's produced by our sister company uh, Tokris. So you've just got the same amount of sample loaded in each one of these, but you have different concentrations of your Protac, and that's allowing you to see increasing degradation of your protein, which is going to uh, manifest itself as a, a drop in signal here, right? So that's kind of the classic way you do a Western mod. This is the classic way people do simple Western. The second thing I've been seeing um, more uncommonly, but I've been starting to see this a little bit, is kind of approaching it more like how you would do an ELISA. So often with an ELISA, you might have samples with very disparate concentrations of a protein of interest. And so what you do is you determine the linear range of your assay, and then you titrate the sample down so that your sample uh, signal is within that linear range. And that might mean that uh, two different samples need to be diluted to a different level so that each one of them is in the linear range. So here's kind of an artificial example of that where you've got a healthy sample and you have an elevated sample. So you might do a uh, minimal titration here to get this sample within the linear range of your assay, which you've already determined pre through assay development uh, versus a much uh, longer dilution series necessary to get in the linear range for this uh, elevated sample here, right? And then you just go and then you back calculate to the original um, so do you back calculate based off of the dilution to determine what the actual original concentration was of that protein? And I would say the seminal example of, of this would be the Beekman et al. paper, which was published in 2018. I consider this a seminal paper. Um, and anybody who's not familiar with this paper, I highly recommend you read it if you're interested in uh, how simple Western can be applied for um, some of this stuff. I, I think this is an absolutely amazing paper. So what they did here, I don't know how easily you can see this, but uh, for the healthy controls, they loaded uh, their sample at 0.1 to 5 micrograms. And then for the DMD samples, I, I should preface, this is this is using Simple Western to look at dystrophin levels in muscular tissue, uh, comparing healthy tissue compared to people with uh, uh, Becker or uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. 
So with the DMD high and low patients, they use a, a concentration of, or, or an amount of 1.25 micrograms. So a tenfold higher amount of loaded total protein. Uh, and then when they analyze the results and then just, they just multiply by 10 here so that they're comparing everything apples to apples. But this is this is their way of bringing both samples within the sort of linear dynamic range of the assay um, based on the development work that they did in that paper. And then the third thing we're seeing is we're seeing a significant uh, move into uh, particularly bioassays, so potency assays with bio biopharmaceutical space. And uh, I'll use a, a, a couple different figures from uh, a reference here. So this is this is from Tom Little Consulting, and he's a, a biostatistician that has a consulting firm, and he does quite a bit of work on bioassays, and and it's published a number of things around bioassays as well. So it's a good reference, and and I want to recognize the that I pulled this figure from his his work that he's published before. So it's just kind of a depiction of a of a potency assay, right? So you've got blue would be your reference standard or your reference, and then on the right here, if you're doing potency testing, it would be like your drug substances, or it might be a serial if you're looking at a vaccine. And that's and that's really the, the two places where we're seeing significant adoption here uh, would be in the cell and gene therapy space and then in the animal vaccine space. And I should say it's more large animal vaccines, but I thought a picture of a puppy dog was uh, cuter, so I picked that instead. Um, and it's not a coincidence, I think, that it's coming in these two places, because in both places we're dealing with uh, complex samples. Um, sometimes it's even a complex decision of what you're going to be measuring in cell and gene therapy because there may be certain different biomarkers for expression or effect of that protein within the cell. And so having an assay that can support a complex sample and be developed fairly easily makes a lot of sense. And that's where Simple Western comes in. So developing a robust assay. Okay, so. Um, so with asset development in Simple Western, you know, we hopefully you guys have have all gone through some of our basic training where you've come to some of our earlier um, online workshops that kind of talk about some of the basic training here. And, and this is really about thinking the next step. So this is much more advanced asset development beyond uh, the asset development that we sort of just typically give people as a basic training. So uh, there's there's things that you should always be thinking about. You should always be thinking about your primary um, antibody selection. The performance of that antibody is really important. Antibody saturation, uh, sample range. But I would also, you know, you're thinking about an assay that you need to have that can support a drug potentially for, you know, cradle to grade drug support. And so um, it's important, I would say, early on, right as you get going, to think about uh, primary antibody availability, primary antibody consistency. Um, also with acid validation, there may be higher bars that you need to think about. Uh, you might maybe be more higher bar for what the signal to noise acceptance is for your dilutional linearity and stuff like that. And then certainly as well, I would immediately start thinking about what your normalization strategy is, uh, what your uh, multiplex capability is, um, and, and do some very quick early uh, characterizations around linearity and precision and all that stuff, because that stuff will then you know, carry forward when you're doing asset validation, there won't be any surprises during asset validation. Um, so in that regard, you know, with our basic training, we tell people, you know, the, the big things that you want to do is screen your antibodies and then do some range finding, which we call optimization, but it's really more of a range finding ex exercise. You do this little three by three matrix, and I'll highlight it next slide, but again, that's stuff that uh, everybody should be familiar with who uh, has used our technology before. Um, but beyond that, I would say, you know, for this, we're going to talk a little bit deeper about antibody saturation determination and then talking about linearity, determining your range and then um, precision. And then if you're, you know, if it's appropriate accuracy, if you're doing like a, a quantitation, an absolute quantitation against a standard curve, for example. OK, so um, we. You know, Greg, I don't I don't know if I uh, saved the changes that you recommended to me because I think there's supposed to be a little highlight here. Um, so we we have a another program that's going to be in the academy here that uh, should be available hopefully about the summer or earlier uh, where we talk through some advanced analytical development um, recommendations. And a lot of this data is going to be available on that. So you're getting a, a sneak peek at some of this. Um, 
But uh, so this is just an example, Dave, that we're going to be using alpha tubulin here, but I, I hope it kind of allows you to understand some of the things that I think about with uh, advanced analytical development. So uh, here we go. This is our screening exercise, right? We, we deliberately made these look like crap because we wanted to uh, sort of zero in everybody's eyes onto the ones that we're going to spend some time with. But you can see like you would never pick antibodies four, five, and six here for your alpha tubulin antibody. I, I would argue you could probably use two here. Uh, the, the, the signal height is concerningly low, but the fact that there is non-specific peaks is not a deal killer. I mean, that's the fact that we have the ability to integrate a peak against separate peaks that are present. You know, this is what's the power of having size separation. If this was an ELISA, all this background would have um, lead to problems with um, um, non-specific signals and non-parallelism um, and all this stuff, but with this you can isolate this peak integrated and independently. So you could use this data, but given the fact that we have antibodies one and two, three here that have really clean data, uh, obviously those are the ones that you would move forward with and, and spend a little more time with. Now you could just pick one antibody here. You could just be like, man, I'm just going to pick three. Three looks good. It's got really little background. Um, I would recommend if you're doing advanced uh, data analysis or I mean asset development, not to just zero in on one of these. I would at least pick a two and spend some time on them, and I'll show you why in the next few slides. Um, oh, no, this is here. Okay, so here's our one assay optimization scheme. So the idea here is you just do a three by three matrix. So you're doing three different sample concentrations. Doop, doop, doop. Um, and then across those, you're doing three different antibody concentrations. What you're looking for first and foremost is which antibody concentration uh, gives you that behavior that you're saturating your antibody kinetics, right? So you're getting that kind of, we're looking for an EC90 where we're pretty much at the top of the plateau here. Uh, and then from that, uh, at that antibody concentration, the uh, titration of your samples should give you a general idea of kind of what range you can work in. So this is going to, this is going to frame out a lot of the work you're going to do afterwards. So even if you're doing advanced analysis and you're going to go beyond this, it's a good place to start because it just kind of book. It just kind of drops you right into where you think you need to be, and then you can do a little bit more uh, characterization after that. So again, here for more information, refer to the online workshop. Back to basics. Okay, so this is the this is the schematic that we use in our basic training to kind of explain to you why you should do assay optimization. And the idea here is you don't want your antibody concentration down here if you can avoid it, because if you're down here, then the antibody is going to be intrinsically unstable. Uh, and so small fluctuations in the performance of the assay are going to have big ramifications on your uh, chemiluminescent signal, so your readout, right? And when your antibody is up here, it's way more stable. Uh, here, here's the here's the funny thing though about this is um, um, look at look at the look at the drawing that I have here. I I've, I've got eleven points here to depict the complexity of this four parameter fit, or actually this is probably even a five parameter fit here. Uh, so that should automatically tell you wait three antibody concentrations is probably not enough to sufficiently really define what your um, which your uh, EC90 is for uh, your antibody concentration. Uh, the dirty truth here is that three by three matrix is not really sufficient to what I would consider to be a bar that I would call assay optimization. It's really more about just framing out um, your assay conditions. And now we're going to get into our alpha tubulin story a little bit further. So, okay. Um, here is our three by three, right? So in each one of these cases, so we've got two different antibodies. I'm going to tell you which one they are. These are both antibodies from cell signaling technologies. One is uh, alpha tubulin uh, catalog number 2125, and the other one is DM1A. By the way, over here, I thought this was really cool to mention that uh, Simple Western is now uh, something that you can click on and filter for in cell signaling technology. They recognize Simple Western as an independent assay that uh, deserves its own uh, call out here. So anytime you're looking at Simple Western, uh, looking for antibodies for Simple Western, besides obviously the catalog of antibodies that we offer through our two uh, companies, R&D Systems and Novus, um, cell signaling is also a, a great resource for antibodies as well. Okay, so here we are. So we've got our three by three matrix. I, so the, the, the heel lysate here is at, at um, a neat 
and then we diluted one to five, and then we diluted it one to twenty-five for both one both of these antibodies. I would say in both cases, the need in one to five is probably a little bit too high of signal to determine an antibody uh, saturation. So we're going to focus on the one to twenty-five here, which is uh, this is a log-log function here, and you can see in red um, the behavior of the antibodies in both cases. I would say in both cases, it's hard to discern from this. Um, if we're reaching saturation, you can see in both cases the slope is starting to bend over between the 1 to 50 and then the 1 to 10 of the antibody concentration. So we're potentially approaching saturation. But again, this is this is where I say like you could stop here for basic analysis. You'd probably be like, oh, let's just do a 1 to 10 here and it's probably good or even maybe even a 1 to 50 you might think is good. Um, and that would probably be good for a lot of basic analysis for a more advanced uh, analysis you run and want to do more. So that's what we did next. The next thing we did was a full antibody saturation curve. So in this case, we're going all the way from a one to five of the antibody all the way down to one to 10,000. And this is all at the same sample concentration because we're exclusively looking at antibody saturation here. And um, you could just eyeball that data if you wanted to, or you could enter it into any other program that you have available to look at antibody saturation. But we have our own tool. This is something that um, one of our FAS, his name is Benjamin, and he's in Europe, and uh, he writes a number of scripts in Python that allow you to, to look uh, and analyze simple Western data a little bit more um, analytically. And so he's got a tool for determining antibody saturation. You just take the data straight out of simple Western, and you drop it into his tool. I can, um, or maybe one of the one of the hosts here can copy and paste this uh, this link into the chat so people can refer to this. His his site here has also a uh, YouTube video that tells you sort of how to um, how to jigger your data so that you can copy it straight out of Simple Western uh, Compass and then drop it straight into his program run the script and then it'll tell you um, what your results are. But here we go. So with the alpha tubulin 2125, uh, the program determines that uh, the uh, EC90 for that antibody will be one to 10. So that's the range that we wanna work with. You can see we have really nice low background here as well. Already we're starting to see a problem with DM1A, uh, which is that uh, saturation wasn't achieved even at one to five. Um, you could move this down, work at 1 to 10 or 1 to 5, but you are going to have a, a little bit more variability in your assay. Um, and the background is creeping up as well quite a bit. So these are both concerns, but I haven't decided I'm not going to use DM1A yet. I still want to continue with it just to characterize a little bit further. So the next thing is now, okay, I've locked in my antibody concentration. In both cases, I'm just going to do 1 to 10. Even though the DM1A wasn't fully saturated at that point because of the high background, I want to go ahead and uh, lock it into 1 to 10 so that we don't have to deal with the background too much. Uh, okay, so this is this is where some things can get a little bit interesting. Um, so, all right, we've, antibody, we've established our antibody concentration. Uh, now we're just doing a sample titration. Same antibody now, sample titration. We're doing a twofold serial dilution here. Um, and hopefully it's very apparent what's different between these two antibodies. The 2125, you can see a pretty reasonably, it, it's, a, it's around a two-fold drop in signal here uh, across each one of these titrations. And this is a larger range, but I'm just showing you the first three points here. With DM1A, you see this precipitous drop in signal, even though you're only looking at a two-fold drop in concentration here. And What's happening is that um, you're, you're just the, the curve with DM1A is is clearly much steeper than the curve is with um, with 2125, and so um, and that and that also manifests itself when you run the numbers graphically. So because 2125 is generally you're seeing about a twofold drop in signal for every twofold drop in concentration, that leads to a sort of a linear response when you see it on a linear linear scale. Uh, DM1A is going to see uh, sort of a power curve here or by a, 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 a um, binomial curve. So you can see that you're seeing more than a twofold drop in signal when you have a twofold drop in concentration. And then it causes it to sort of compress against the bottom here. You can run the same data doing a log log curve, and this will now cause the data to be to be linear on a log log curve but you'll have a difference in the slopes. And that difference in slopes 
um, is what tells you that one of these has a different um, signal response to a dose curve than the other. And as a matter of fact, you can use that slope to tell you what's happening here. So with a slope that's less than one, you're basically getting a, a flat dose response with one that's uh, got a slope of one on the log log scale. Uh, that's basically a proportional response. And then if it's greater than one, then uh, it's a steep response. And, and so I can actually just tell you what those numbers are just here. So here's the, here's the linear equations off of this log log scale. Um, so here's the here's the um, slope for the red line, which is our 2 and 2, 5, and then here's the slope for the DM1A, which is our uh, other antibody. And then when you just take it uh, 2 to the power of that slope, then you get what the uh, what the actual like average signal drop is across each one of these ranges. So for 2 and 2, 5, it's not perfectly flat, but you're having about a 2 2.17 fold drop in signal for every two fold drop in concentration. Uh, versus DM1A, where it's a much steeper drop. You're seeing uh, 3.25, 3.26, sorry, full drop in signal for every two full drop of dilution. Um, okay, well, does that mean DM1A is not positive? You can't use it. No, I, I wouldn't say that. I would say you can work with antibodies with a steeper dilution response, uh, but you just need to be aware of it and, and you need to plan accordingly. For example, uh, you could work in a very narrow range of that sample so that you're you're not sort of blowing out, like trying to compare things that are very disparate in terms of signal, right? Uh, the second thing, which is probably the better thing to do, which is to develop a standard curve, right? If you were to just take these numbers uh, as raw numbers and not normalize them against a standard curve, uh, and you were just to look at percent recovery, which what you would do is just take your top point, that's your 100% that's your recovery, and then in each one of your dilutions, you just back multiply it from its dilution. And then if you had a perfectly uniform dose response, then you should see uh, these numbers just be flat, 100%, right? A lot of, you'll either hear with an ELISA space like a 80 to 120 is acceptable, um, it's considered to be dilutionally linear, or uh, sometimes it's 70% to 130% to 130%. I did a tighter number here and did a 80 to, um, see, maybe I did 75, sorry, I split the difference, 75 to 125 I did here. Um, and so two and two five, uh, there's a number of points that are sort of dilutionally linear right on right off the bat before it starts to fall off the back end. Uh, with the DM1A, you immediately fall out of the dilutional linear range um, with this one. You can see it's dropping uh, even with this. This is a number that are sort of back calculated to the original concentration, and you can see it's still giving you a much more reported low number. There's a, there's a lot of other prices. So even if you do the standard curve, so even if you were to work with DM1A, uh, there's, a, there's a number of other consequences. Number one, um, you lose linear range, right? Because the, the signal is going to fall from your upper limit of the instrument's capability all the way through the longer limit detection very rapidly if you have a steeper curve. So whereas 2125, we've got uh, three to four logs of range to work with here. Uh, for DM1A, we're talking about one and a half to two logs. So, we're pretty much chopping our uh, dynamic range by half um, with this. Also, this is going to, you know, because you're you're at a steeper curve, then um, similar to the fact that a, a dilutional response is much steeper, the imprecision is also going to be a lot greater. So, whereas from uh, a small experiment that we did here, uh, we got a precision of six percent for two one two five. Uh, we were looking at uh, an imprecision of about thirteen percent for uh, DM1A. So, so this is still a good number here, and, and we, we're probably going to rerun this just to get a little more statistics around the imprecision of these two. But uh, just right off the bat, you can see it's, it's looking like it's about double the imprecision, which is in, which is kind of consistent with the difference in, um, in slope here as well. This can lead to problems with multiplexing. Um, and also, you know, if you're if you're if you're doing things relative to a standard curve, it can be unstable, and that can similarly have an effect on if you're trying to do like parallelism um, when you're doing something like potency assay. And then uh, down here again, uh, just to mention that uh, this this is all going to be stuff that we're going to discuss um, or, or have available um, through a uh, course um, called the Advanced Assay Development Course, and that should be coming in the summer or sooner. OK, so so now we're kind of bringing it into this uh, bioassay space, right? So. Um, so the, the third thing that we're seeing people do besides do classic Western style assays, do more ELISA 
assays. And the third one is these uh, relative potency assays using parallelism. And this is just kind of a framework to talk about what I mean by parallelism. So um, I, I have seen people do potency assays where they're not using parallelism, but the standard method for doing potency assays is to do some sort of parallelism based assay. And the reason why you're doing parallelism is so you've got a reference standard. That reference standard is what you defined. Uh, if it's in drug development, it's going to be something that's going to be cross referenced against your um, potency testing that was done in preclinical. So this is going to define what your what your drug potency is going to be. So now any drug that you release off your product line, you need to know what the potency is relative to that to make sure that it's within an acceptable range for delivering to patients. And so it's very important to get that number right. And uh, if you're just to pick a single point on a curve and say, I'm just going to test this point and say, based off of this, I'm measuring how relatively strong my drug is relative to my reference. If your assay is such that um, it's non-parallel, depending on where you pick that point could change what you say your potency is. In this example here, if you were to pick this point to define the potency of your, of your or sorry, this is the test here. If you were to use this, point here to define the potency of your test, then you would report out a higher potency than if you pick this point here. And this suggests that your assay in general is inconsistent between your reference standard and your drug substance, your reference standard and your serial. And so um, this immediately flags that there's, there's something you don't understand about your assay. So you don't, um, you, you shouldn't be able to report out your results. Um, that's, that's where parallelism is the first step for approving an assay like this. Once the assay passes because of parallelism, then you, across this whole range, should be able to measure the same potency difference and be able to report out a relative potency. There's two different general ways that I have seen potency assays presented. Um, one is, is probably the more classic one that we see. This is really coming directly out of the ELISA world. And this is where you do a, a lot a logistical fit, and it's either going to be a three PL, four PL, or a five PL. I think most people do three or do four, but you see five and three as well um, in the in the USDA uh, their recommendation within that uh, 800, 112, I believe is a three PL fit. Um, and and what that's doing is it's defining the upper asymptote of your assay, the full range of your assay, and the lower asymptote of the assay. The advantage of this is you understand the full breadth of your assay, top to bottom. Um, the, the, the price you pay is that it requires more data to be able to, to do this. Um, the alternative way that uh, you see potency assays done, and I have seen uh, specifically cell and gene therapies that are pretty far along that are being supported by this, it's called a uh, parallel line analysis or PLA. This, because you're not defining the full range of your assay, you're just defining the linear range of your assay, you don't need as many data points to describe the whole complexity of it. Um, and so minimally five point curve is but uh, is specifically recommended. Again, this is data that I'm pulling out of Tom Little's consulting's um, publications that he's published here, and I have the reference right here for people. Uh, so you can you can actually read the paper that I'm drawing this data from. Okay, so potency on simple Western, what's the advantage? Um, so there, there's two big things that are advantageous on simple Western over an ELISA. One of them is uh, parallelism and matrix effects. So um, when you're doing ELISA, you've got your plate, you've added your detect your uh, capture antibody on there, and then you're adding your sample directly on top of it. That means everything in that sample is presenting an issue, right? You've got a non-specific bind. You also on the left here, you got matrix effects. Um, and because with simple Western, you're separating your protein by size, and then you're flushing out that capillary, and you don't do the amino acid until you've cleared out that capillary. Uh, really, the matrix effects have been completely removed by the time you're doing your amino acid. Um, the other thing with, with an ELISA is uh, there's no 100% specific amino assay, right? Uh, so there's always going to be some amount of contention with non-specific binding from other proteins. But with simple Western, because you're separating your protein by size, uh, even when you have a complex mixture and you even see some non-specific binding, that is being separated by size, so you can still quantitate your peak of interest and integrate it independent of those other things. That's something you cannot do with an ELISA. Um, now, what about the 4PL fit versus the PLA fit? Um, I like to talk about two things here with Simple Western. One is uh, the lower asymptote. Okay, so all assays have a background, right? 
Uh, for Eliza, your signal is really built on top of the background. You're always going to have some amount of background that the signal is going to stack on top of. Uh, Simple Western does have a background as well, um, but because we're doing electropharogram data, we can actually integrate the peak independent of the background. So you, there are a there are cases where our assay will still show sort of a flattening out of the signal as it reaches uh, approaches um, the LOQ. But there's a lot of cases where our signal is absolutely linear all the way down to um, LOQ. And so um, that need to describe that lower asymptote is often not necessary within our system. And then the my own upper, yeah, upper asymptote. So the other thing is the upper asymptote. So um, this, one, this one is a little bit more contentious. So with uh, so many, many different factors will define with your other asymptote is for a um, an amino acid, right? So within ELISA, the two biggies are if you, um, is substrate depletion or anti saturation. So with substrate depletion, I'm thinking about like with a, with a classic color metric ELISA, there's an absorbance limit for that substrate, which usually I think is at around two uh, absorbance units. So what's defining the upper limit of your assay is not the behavior of your antibody as it interacts with the antigen, but it's actually the saturation of your of your reagent or depletion of your reagent that's causing that upper limit. And with simple Western, similarly, um, the, the kinetics of the assay is such that the things that are really driving the upper limit of detection and quantitation in our assay is camera saturation in the case of uh, fluorescence assays or chemoluminescence detection or, or, or depletion of your chemoluminescent reagent uh, for, uh, for, um, for chemoluminescent assays. So, so you can go up there and, and people do go up there, but there is some risk because the, the behavior the system is a little bit different than the ELISA when you get above sort of the, the when you're sort of pushing the limit of our instrument. For example, like uh, if you've got, a, let's say you've got a wide peak, so it's got a high area, but it's, it's kind of the lower uh, height. That peak is gonna saturate slower because it's it's sharing its signal over a broader range of, of, the, of the capillary. So it's not gonna, saturate of the camera quite as quickly versus a narrow sharp peak, um, which might have a smaller total signal than the fat peak, but because it's got a sharper peak, it's gonna hit camera saturation sooner. So you might even have situations where you've got parallelism and a beautiful assay coming up through the top, but as you crest above sort of the pushing the limit of our cumulescent substrate or pushing the limit of our camera, you'll actually see an inversion up at the top here. And that doesn't, that doesn't prove that the assay is not parallel within the uh, main linear range of the assay. It's just that you're looking at two different effects here, which is what's defining what behave, the behavior at the top of the assay versus the behavior of the assay in the linear range of it. So th those are some of the arguments that I that I make for why you might want to do a PLA assay versus a uh, four PL fit assay. Um, what I would say though is uh, I'm I'm more of a proponent to PLA, I will say, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean everybody is that way. And I think um, for me, I think a lot of the things that cause non-parallelism, like um, matrix effects and non-specific binding, are removed in our assay, which argues you don't need as much information about the total assay parameters um, to, to argue that you need a 4 PL fit. But there are data that empirically show that our instrument works well with a 4 PL fit, and in those cases, I've seen people move forward with a 4 PL fit. Uh, to do parallelism-based assays, and their data look quite beautiful. So it's really something that needs to be determined empirically, and you need to be able to defend your position for what assay you're doing, obviously, with whatever regulatory agency you're submitting this to. All right, potency data examples. All right, we've got 20 minutes left. Um, I, I've been talking a lot, so hopefully I can go through this, but you guys can, um, I, I won't go through it too fast. Okay, so we had a potency model that we developed um, this is so now I'm moving into work that was developed by our application scientist team. This is an internal team who produces a lot of the application notes that you guys have hopefully taken advantage of and read. There's some really, really good, powerful data that comes out of this group. They also support a number of customers through custom work as well. Um, so a lot of scientific expertise in that group, and that's what we're going to be showing in the next two uh, sections here. So this first one was a conceptualized assay for looking at potency. So the first thing they did was they defined the total range of the assay, as I mentioned. So you've got this nice, beautiful 4PL fit showing like sort of the whole range, upper and lower um, signals as well here. 
But uh, for this assay, they were going to do a, a PLA-based assay. So the first thing they did was they identified what of this is the linear range here. So they cropped it to the linear range. It ended up being about a three log range. So we have a lot of, we got a lot of room to work with here. Um, the advantage of doing a PLA-based assay is because you only need five data points to define the linear range, um, this within a, a small box like a West, Jess, or Abbey, uh, you got the advantage of being able to sort of double up and get um, duplicate data points on a single play, which gives you a lot more statistical power. So here we've got our reference standard. We've got five uh, dilutions here, and then we have our test article, and then again, another reference, and then another test article. So everything in duplicate and split across the plate. So here's one experiment. This is doing a three-fold titration of this target, and you can see the reference, and you can see the test. These are the electropharogram data, and then the... Um, the relaying view data as well, just to show you both. And then uh, for a PLA-based assay, um, I, I've consistently seen it reported out as a log-log. The log-log um, uh, graphing of the data allows you to look at parallelism of, of the two different articles. So in this case, the expected was um, 1.25. So the reference or the test should have a potency of 1.25 relative to the reference. Uh, the results here were 1.31, so about about 5% difference, which is pretty very good for a bioassay like this. Uh, they did they repeated again doing a two-fold titration series, so now it's still five points. So you're talking about a tighter range here, uh, and and actually in this case with this experiment, they had an even closer expected relative to the um, observed 1.23 versus 1.25. So for this, there were six different independent runs that were prepared. These are all with uh, references and test samples were prepared independently. And when they look across the six runs, looking at an average uh, and a precision here, you can see that the bias in the assay is, is not um, statistically relevant and the precision here uh, ended up being 6.6%. Uh, so very, very good precision across all of these in terms of the independent potencies that were determined on each one of these runs. Um, we decided to put that test uh, through its paces, so we had the opportunity to go up um, to Iowa State. There's there's a um, like a biotech uh, incubator called Cyvax that's um, associated with the university. There, we did a demo. We brought in ten brand new users. So these are people who I think, for the most part, I think there was a few people who had experience with simple western. But for the most part, these were all people who literally never touched the simple westerns before. And we handed them a pipette and said, "You're going to do a potency assay." And then we took all that data and we aggregated. Um, so this is this is how robust this system is um, for like analyst to analyst variability. You can't really throw in more variability than this. Uh, and, and here's the results that were generated from that assay. So uh, nice looking. This is a serial versus a reference here. And uh, this is nomenclature again that comes out of uh, the animal vaccine world for, for folks that are um, from the uh, drug development world. This would be like a reference standard versus a drug substance. And if you do because so statistically these were parallel. Uh, this was all and, and the modeling was done in uh, GraphPred Prism. Uh, so was, these are consistent. These are considered to be statistically insignificant in terms of uh, non-parallelism. So those are considered parallel. So you can either do parallel modeling here, where you use the same slope, and in that case, the observed uh, relative potency was 1.23 versus 1.25. Um, or if you want to do independent slope, so this is non-parallel modeling, uh, then then the results come out as 1.31 versus 1.25. So even here, which is showing a a, a worse uh, oh, and for this one, by the way, for this one, I picked a midpoint of the curve to determine the difference in potency. With this, because I'm using the same uh, slope, uh, because they're not considered like, statistically different, then you can pick anywhere on the curve and you would get the same number here. But either, either way, uh, whether or not you use either one of these ways to analyze your uh, relative potency, the numbers are really close. Considering um, what we did here, this was pretty good data. All right, so now let's move into some AEV stuff. Okay. So let me let me talk about the background about how this assay was approached. So this is again work that was developed by our application science team, and they're going to be doing an app note on this. So uh, um, hopefully at some point in the near future, you will see this be uh, publicized, and you can come and take a look at this. But here's what we're doing here. So um, they were looking at AVs. In this case, they're comparing AV2 versus AV9. But just to kind of simplify the story here, 
uh, for something that might be a little more relevant to people. Let's say you've got your uh, reference standard and then you've, well, you want to measure the potency of another virus here. So I've got these empty versus fulls to make it kind of cute. So you're, you're spiking different amounts of your virus onto uh, a uniform amount of cells, the same number of cells. And then you're measuring the transduced protein expression here. So you're going to see a titration. In this case, we're looking at GFP expression in these cells. And then um, you should be able to then compare the uh, potency over that range for your reference standard versus your drug substance. And that's, and that's the result, right? So you're measuring same amount of total protein, same amount of cells, but different amounts of protein expression based off of how much uh, virus was there to transduce it. So for this particular example, uh, so we got AV2 versus AV9, they were dosed in the same number of cells. Um, but uh, AV2, because it's much more infective, uh, we transduced, the, the, the app science group transduced it at uh, 40,000 vector genes per cell, all the way down to six here. So this is a five-fold titration series. And then down here, we've got for AV9, starting with 10 to the six viral genomes per cell, all the way down to 1,600 viral genomes per cell. And then there's a number of controls. So uh, for positive control, we've got uh, recombinant GFP, so 0.1 uh, mg per mil of uh, untreated HEP-G2 lysates, and then um, with spiked in with GFP uh, at five nanograms per mil and 0.5 nanograms per mil. And then we have an untreated lysate as well. All cells were, you know, af after incubation, um, time given to transduce and express GFP. All cells were denatured and then uh, reduced under reducing conditions for five minutes for 95 degrees. So this is our sort of standard protocol for preparing cells. And I'm just measuring it using this anti-GFP antibody here. Here's the uh, antibody catalog number. Um, also for this, uh, because we're using a just here, we are able to, and because we're looking at, we want to see the same amount of total cells per uh, measure. And we're just looking at changes in GFP level. Uh, we normalized everything using the total protein assay uh, doing pre-plux. And so this is kind of what the results are going to look like. So here is the total protein measured in the same capillary using replex. Uh, and then we've got either, uh, you know, different levels of GFP. In this case, we're looking at here's the difference between AV2 uh, versus AV9. You see a huge difference in the signal of GFP here, but we have the same amount of total protein that's loaded here. This is shown graphically here, and then this is shown in a lane view here, so you can see kind of like the total protein Kumasi-esque image here versus the uh, the signal of GFP. Um, okay, so then in terms of potency detection, our determination uh, peak areas graphed according to the vial content. Uh, and then again, we measured against total protein for normalization. And then the data was transformed like I was showing before, so we're going to do a log log. A transformation of the data to analyze it and then look at a, a linear regression fit of that log log data. Um, and then based off of that, then we back calculate what the difference in potency is by taking the difference and then and then reversing the, the log function. So doing a, a power 10 to the power of the, the, the value that was determined to determine the original linear uh, difference between the signals. So um, so we did this over, so that the, that group did it over 10 days. So um, in each case, you've got AV2, sort of the same structure as we showed before. So we've got AV2 versus, before it was drug substance versus reference. Here we're doing AV2, then AV9, then AV2, then AV9, and we have the controls here. And here's the results down below. You can see our um, signal titration over these ranges for AV9 and AV2, uh, looking at expression of GFP. Uh, that was run one, here's run two, run three. Really nice consistency across uh, all three of those runs. And then when we take that data, we actually analyze it. Again, this is all on, on PRISM, and you've got log area versus the um, AV uh, viral genomes per cell, also um, on a log scale here. When you look at the difference, a pretty, pretty wide range between these two. This is definitely not something that you would ever measure in a potency assay. You'd be looking at much tighter differences you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 percent differences uh, between your samples, not in this case uh, magnitude differences. But it just shows you uh, generally sort of how big a range that we can tolerate within this assay. Uh, AV2 here, we're burning out. This is actually becoming saturated at the fifth point. So for the for the experiment done here, uh, they, they ruled out this point and they just analyzed four points. So I'm going to focus on the adjusted values here. But here you can see uh, these were considered to be parallel lines, and so we are able to analyze these 
and uh, nice, nice fit here in terms of the R squared values. When we calculate the relative potencies between AAV2 and AAV9, AAV9 is known to be a much poorer transducer relative to AAV2, and sure enough, that's the results here. Um, on the independent runs, we're looking at about an average of about 1600 fold difference in a relative potency of AAV9 compared to AAV2. So AAV9 is 1600 times more less potent in terms of its transduction of GFP and uh, G2 cells. And again, kind of looking at these numbers this way uh, in terms of the repeatability, and uh, you can look at all points here, which is the blue scale or the adjusted. Uh, in both cases, the results are fairly similar, uh, which is that we have about uh, 1600 with the adjusted full difference in um, potency. And then the precision across these three runs end up being about 5%. So good, good statistics across the runs here. OK, so just to summarize everything, we have a few minutes left. Um, so Simple Western is a, is a powerful tool. It's a powerful analytical tool, and it combines uh, capillary electrophoresis with amino acid detection. It is not a Western blot. Um, assay development is quick, but doing your due diligence pays off, especially when it comes to picking a good antibody. I cannot say that enough. Um, so Simple Western supports complex acid designs, including potency testing, and the proof is in the pudding. We're seeing a lot of adoption of it with these complex samples where ELISA has been uh, historically difficult to apply. Um, so Simple Western, in that sense, uh, solves a lot of the challenges with developing ELISAs against complex samples, such as crude lysates, um, viral gene um, therapy targets, and, and stuff like that. And I believe that is the end. All right, so we've got like seven minutes left. I saw that there were some comments in the um, in the chat here, so happy to take some questions now. And we do have a couple of uh, questions in the chat that we saved for you. So, um, are you do you, are you able to see those? Yeah. Um, all right. So the first one was from Chris Tong. Chris asked, uh, when dealing with vaccine potency testing of the same antigen but different adjuvants, should you run separate three by threes for each type of adjuvant? Um, I would say I would probably say yes. If you're not if you're not breaking the adjuvant, so you're running it in the presence of the adjuvant, I would I would recommend just it's probably just it's it's quick it's such a quick and easy experiment it's it's probably worth doing the due diligence um it hopefully wouldn't make a difference and if you're if you're breaking it and separating your sample out then it should definitely not make a difference but it, it's worth still i think I, I think i would probably check it personally if i was in that position and then um chris apparently agreed with something i said I think I remember when that popped up. And then um, how about serum samples comparing ELISA versus Jeffs? That's a, that's a good question with serum samples. So we do do serum samples on Jeffs. Um, I would say that ELISA is so established in the world of serum that uh, often there's a, there's a solution with an ELISA that's already available. And I've often tried to steer people towards some of our other platforms, Luminex or um, Ella in particular is absolutely fabulous because it's a fully automated ELISA system. So you get the same experience as Simple Western. You just kind of like, you know, load your sample and go, uh, but it has the, the power of an ELISA system. If there's not a solution for your particular target, um, which is a serum sample, then uh, just starts to make a lot of sense. But if there's already something out there, I don't know. I, I would I would highly recommend some of our other platforms as well um, to to look at solutions besides just simple Western in that case. Any other questions people want to post or? All right. Well, maybe we can wrap it up then. I appreciate everybody who joined the call.
I hope this was uh, informative and I didn't go through it too fast. Thank you so much, Tim. This was super great. And thank you all for, for joining us. Cool, guys. Well, take care, everybody. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks for running this, Julia.